Guido, and thanks uh, the organizers, Pablo Rongje and Mingha, and for uh, inviting me to speak to this workshop. So uh, I will just uh, do a tutorial here since uh, uh, people are using geometric methods and uh, information geometry has increasingly uh, coming to you know, people's uh, uh, recognition about uh, one of the tools that they want to use. So, but I want to uh, just give, uh, just go ahead and then just do some tutorial on this. And then, uh, uh, so the topics which are planned to cover include starting from uh, manifold statistical models and then talk about, uh, you know, in particular, the statistical models, the fish information, the change of parameterization, and then talk about the dualities for statistical inference, uh, EM. Uh, geodesic projections and then the maximum entropy and uh, and general Pythagorean theorem and so forth. And then I will uh, introduce the topic of the so-called the, the, the geometrical structure for the statistical manifold structure. So, and uh, that's the essentially the, ba the bare minimum, you know, for someone who want to know information geometry. Uh, I plan to also introduce some advanced, more advanced topic, but then I found out that it will just run way over the number of slides and for the given time. So probably will be reserved for some uh, future you know, uh, uh, opportunity. So, uh, so the manifold of statistical models, uh, I will start with an example, the univariate normal distribution. Okay, univariate normal distribution with the, so here omega is a random variable. Uh, that can be uh, have the sample space of R, the real line, and the mu and sigma are the uh, parameters, right? I, I collectively call mu sigma, I call theta. Theta was just a uh, uh, parameterization of this, uh, this uh, power distribution, okay? So this uh, family, so if we are interested in this, the, the entire family of normal distributions with uh, a random variable on the real line. So in other words, we are looking at the family of all these distributions with all possible parameters. Okay, so if you choose theta, mu theta, you get uh, one distribution, choose another mu theta, you get, get another one. So I, we want to look at the whole set, the whole set. So let's look at some of the boundaries for this set, okay, in terms of the, parameter, the parameters, you know. Uh, so the, these uh, at extreme, when sigma go to zero, this would be a, a delta function, right? This would be a delta function, which is an extreme case of a normal distribution. This is actually is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really a distribution uh, as opposed to probably density functions or a density function. Uh, on the other side, if uh, sigma go to infinity, well, this uh, normal distribution become a uniform distribution on the real line. Okay, so these are the uh, extreme cases for this whole set of normal distributions. So we are now interested in this object of this entire set of normal distributions with uh, theta as the parameter, you know, those mu and sigma as a parameter. So well, normal distributions uh, arise you know, in many different settings, but uh, uh, it, it, we are going to talk about this. It's an exponential family, but also it is a location scale family. It's a location scale family with mu and sigma, right? So uh, we want to see how these different aspects of a normal distribution may be captured by uh, by a kind of by the study of its of uh, the geometry on this entire set. Okay, so that's the kind of a, a very you know the first uh, introduction about uh, a motivation to uh, to how we deal with this, how uh, what what we are going to study. So how we are going to deal with this is that now let's have first have a, a way to present to represent the entire set of this normal distribution, the entire family of normal distribution, right? So what we do is that. Uh, on the right hand side, these are the normal distributions, one member, another member, there are four members here. So on the left, we look at the parameter space, namely we put the mu as the x axis, sigma as the y axis. Okay, so that's a very natural way of thinking is a parameterization of the normal distribution. So in this case, mu can go to minus from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? And the sigma can go from zero to plus infinity. So that would exhaustively represent our entire family of normal distributions, okay? So any member can be found by, you know, and, uh, by one point on the left, which indexing normal distribution, right? So we have four normal distributions here, these two normal distribution like here, and these two normal distribution, these two, okay? So we have each normal distribution just become now one point in the parameter space. So now, 
having this representation of the entire set of normal distributions, we want to see so the geometry of it, what kind of a geometry we, we need to uh, put on uh, this space. So, uh, but immediately we realized that the uh, uh, look for simple statistical considerations would tell us that these two distributions are closer to each other than these two distributions because these two with smaller variance and these two with larger variance, even though the separation of the mean are the same. So the difference in means are the same. So this gives rise to uh, a kind of a, a requirement that we want this geometry such that these two are points are kind of farther apart and these two points are closer, right? That, which means that immediately that says that no, we, we, don't, we can't just impose a Euclidean metric on this, on, on, on this space, okay? So we need to do something else. We need to uh, pro prescribe something else to capture this fact, okay? So that's the motivation for the use of a non-Euclidean kind of a uh, geometry, okay? So now let's, in order to consider what kind of a geometry we need to we want to put on to this. So let's just have some general, uh, study or understanding of, uh, of stats for statistical models, for statistical models. So uh, say we have, a, say, a, a sample space. I use the capital omega to represent the sample space. And suppose the sample space, you now we are provided with some kind of a reference measure, you know, and then, well, P, PD mu, you know, it, this is just one of the, one of probability, uh, 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 the, the measures, the, the probability measure you know, on the sample space. And the, this, Small omega is the is the data or the, the random variable, okay? The the, the, the data on, on this set. So suppose we have the data is generated by say this P, and then we have a probability model uh, Q, which Q can possibly be different from P. So Q is our model and P is a data generating probability distribution, okay? So probability density for generating that data. So clearly uh, upon observing data, okay, there is a loss, which we can use the, uh, the log loss, which is minus log of a Q of any model. So Q is our model. So uh, Jensen inequality provides that we have this uh, inequality, which basically the expected loss for any other model, okay, would also always be larger than the loss incurred by the true, uh, the true probability that generate the data generating process. Okay, so this is a, uh, a very straightforward kind of, a, I know, uh, uh, so the expected loss is a minimal when the model Q, it really matches the data generating process, right? So that's a very stand, uh, the starting point for statistical inference. Now, if we take the difference between the expected loss of our model and the minimal, the minimal loss on this, this is nothing more than just the KL divergence, right? So in a sense that, KL divergence comes out very naturally when we study the family of um, statistical models, right? So that's a measure for the difference between, you know, uh, how good or how or no, the difference between two models, two models. So the reason the okay, KL divergence is non-symmetric and uh, this non, uh, because KPQ is not equal KQP. And this is actually a nice property instead of a nuance because in statistical, inference setting, we do differentiate between the data generating uh, distribution and the model distribution. So this is a, a, something it turns out to, to be quite nice. And in fact, this, you can see this in why this comes out, right? So, so for the KL divergence, well, later we're gonna talk about, there may be a more appropriate form to use the so-called extended KL divergence uh, because this whole integral itself would be greater than zero for any random variable, but we're going to reserve it for a little bit for later. And important, another important thing to, to say is that uh, uh, I use the, sometimes I write P and Q, well, sorry, I, I, in the later, I used this, uh, this P and Q and used the two parallel lines in between that. I should have changed this uh, notation here because I, when I, whenever I use the two density functions, I use this two parallel lines here. And then whenever I, I use parametric, parametric representation, I use the X, X being the parameter. So X indexing the distribution P and X indexing the distribution Q. So, that, so in this case, KL divergence become just a two variable function, right? So KL divergence become a, a in, originally it was a, it was a, a functional on two density functions, but then it becomes really a function of two uh, variables. 
So for normal distribution, we can calculate the KL divergence, which is essentially just, uh, you know, just do this, plug this calculation, you have this formula, okay? Now, uh, if we were to look at the two models which are close to each other, so you know, those mu one is close to mu two and sigma one is close to sigma two, okay? We can perform Taylor expansion. And after performing Taylor expansion, what we get is an expression like this, okay? An expression like this. So, which is basically, you know, you have uh, the zeroth order term vanishes and also the first order term also vanish, okay? And then the only, the first surviving term is the second uh, order term. So, which is, can be written in this format, the second order term, okay? Uh, which delta theta is just you know, delta mu delta sigma. G is this matrix and like this, this, these are two vectors, okay? So, so this quantity, well, in general, this quantity I, you know, here, is nothing but the, uh, the uh, fish information, okay? So fish information in general is defined in this way, in this way, and we will show later on, in general, you can have a fish information, uh, you can have the fish information to uh, just, uh, you know, have a lowest order expansion, then you get this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, KL divergence, lowest order expansion of KL divergence get the fish. So, it was, uh, I think, Rao and then also Jeffrey at that time studied this and proposed to use this I as the Riemannian metric on M, as Riemannian metric, because the Riemannian metric is something that can be used to uh, calculate the line elements uh, on this manifold. And after integration, this gives the distance, this gives the di distance uh, measure on the manifold, okay? So, uh, but I want to note here that we use here x, okay, yeah, here, yeah, I use x instead of theta, okay. So later on, we're going to use uh, uh, x generically as meaning a parameterization, okay. And uh, so in general, we can use any parameterization x uh, uh, for parameterized you know, density function, but the, 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 the kind of the, uh, so this x provides a natural kind of coordinate chart for the manifold. So in other words, because x is, a value is taking its value in Rn, so it provides a very natural chart, uh, geometrically speaking, a natural chart to, to index uh, a distribution. Okay, that's straightforward. But the, the, the next thing is a little bit uh, of, of interest and need some calculation. So, but we can certainly change parameterization, right? So we can, we can change, say, the same density function, we can change it to x and we, we can use u as long as we had take x as a function of u, for instance. It becomes a no, another parameterization of the same density function, okay? So this is viewed as being a change of coordinates on the manifold, okay? Now, when we change the parameterization, the functional form of density changes. So that's why it's in, important to study how, what are the invariants in this, on this manifold that in some way that co-varies as you change parameterization, okay? What are the invariants which are, truly reflecting truly something which is intrinsic to the um, manifold itself, but not to what you happen to parameterize it, okay? So that's the important first question that we want to resolve. So uh, let's give an example for this. Let's say in general, let's look at say for instance, for fish information. So for fish information, right? Fish information, we can write it this way, okay? So because it's the, it's the outer product of this. So have this column, make a column vector and then the row vector here, it's the outer product. So one, one is just this, one, two, one, three, and two, one, and so forth, okay? So it's like this. So first, this Fisher metric is, uh, is uh, oh, it, it can be, it, it's used as the Riemannian metric, but for the Riemannian metric, we need it to be positive definite. So let's check that it is indeed positive, uh, well, at least positive semi-definite, okay? So let's check for that. Well, we can take any arbitrary vector, and then we form, uh, this number, okay, which is basically we multiply the row and column, you know, just and then you just turn this into a number. And this, you have the square here, and this is always greater than or equal to zero, and this is non negative, and so therefore this is always non negative, okay? So the, 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 the fact that Fisher met the Fisher um, matrix is positive semi definite allows us to use it as a Riemannian metric, okay? So that's a, an important uh, side note. To realize. Now, uh, let's now look at how this metric itself, because the metric itself depends on the parameterization of x, okay, right? Because it depends on 
you know, because we're taking the derivative with respect to this x, okay? So let's look at how does that uh, uh, work with the change of parameterization. So now let's re look at our, re-examine our normal distribution. So normal distribution. So we can expand it out. We expand the normal distribution out, okay? And we can write it this way. Okay, now we can, now what we do is that this is the random variable. So we write, we put this one, we write this one as x1 and we write this one as x2. This is omega and this is omega square, okay? And the remaining terms we just put together to be like this. So we get a representation of normal distribution, univariate normal distribution in this form. And this is the so-called the exponential family, the exponential family form. So this is the location scale uh, representation of the normal distribution. But this way, we use the x parameterization makes it uh, an exponential family, okay? And so here x, one x two can be taken to be a new parameters, right? Because they are related to the old parameter in this way, and or you can solve it in the other way around, and you, you can. So this is just a simple kind of a, a conic or pro, real parameterization. In geometrically speaking, it's kind of a real parameterization. I mean, a, a conic transformation, conic transformation, which is what real parameterization is uh, in, in 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 statistics. So this phi function, this function is just here. Okay, so this is the now. Well, certainly we can have other reparameterizations. Okay, so we can have other reparameterizations. Oops, did I lose anyone? Oops. Hello. Yeah. I can oh, hear. I oh idea. Okay, so sorry. No, somehow my screen kind of just flashed out, and all the all the people disappeared. <laughs> so. Yeah, the same yeah, happened to me, but I can see your screen. Okay, no, right. Yeah, no, no. This is a, it's, it would be nice to have actually have uh, some face there. So I know. And, uh, okay. Or, or if you don't, <laughs> if, if you don't see, you no, know, if something gets wrong, just let me know. But on the other hand, I would not know without uh, if my, my connections are, uh, I went back. Anyway, so uh, we can have a, another parameterization, right? So we can have a parameterization, say, using use. Okay. So for instance, we can use the, uh, say, Let's take uh, the moment, the first moment and the second moment. Yeah, we can do the first, we can do the first moment and we do the second moment, right? Okay, so we can do the two, so first and second moment. So we can write, you know, then the user, you can write them as function of mu and sigma, yeah? Or we can write the use in terms of the x, here x1. By the way, this one, two is, the, just the two components. Now use, I use the subscript, x I use superscript, you may, I wonder why I'm not consistent in this, but there's a good reason for that. You will find out later on, okay? But I'm, I'm intentionally making the superscript for X and lower script for, for U, and it's, it will be explained later on. But it's just a different parameterization at this point. So this is the first component, you know, X1, U1, U2 is another parameterization okay, like this. Now, we can use this parameterization, U1, U2, but then you can check. It turns out that U1, U2 is related to this phi function, phi function is what we had earlier, this phi function, right? This phi function here. It is related to this phi function by this first derivative, okay? So uh, th this is a, a feature which is a very universal feature for the exponential family, for the ex ex exponential. So the, the U parameterization, the, uh, the moment parameterization is simply the, the first derivative, first derivative of phi, okay? So now it turns out that this phi, is a convex function in, in X, okay? So we can compute its convex conjugate expressed in U, which is, turns out this is another convex function in U, okay? And these are conjugate, convex conjugate functions of each other. Now, if you look at the U, it's interesting because, I mean, if you look at the phi star U, phi star U, what is phi star U? When you can write it out, well, in U, right? But I, if I rewrite it out in terms of, you know, sigma, this is minus log sigma. Sigma write it as a function of u. Okay, so because this thing is just sigma. This nothing, this is the square, no, I mean square root of this is just sigma. So, but the sigma is the actually the entropy of this. Okay, so the entropy of normal distribution you can write it out. It's just minus log sigma. Okay, so, so now S of theta, this is not strictly convex in, in this, in theta, but the, phi star is strictly convex in U, okay? So now you get something that's kind of interesting that 
in for normal distribution, if we use, if we stay with the theta parametrization, well, we just, uh, you know, this is how we, we, we start with, right? We can derive a very nice simple form of the Fisher metric, but it is not an exponential family. But if we use the U parametrization or X parametrization, turns out they are associated with these potentials and they are exponential family, okay? So let me explain this situation. So we have three sets of parameters, okay? We have theta, we have X, and we have U. They specify one another, right? They can specify one another, you can change. And then we can do corner change or reparametrization. This is controlled by Jacobian. The Jacobian is a two by two matrix here in this case that controls the, the, the corner change, right? The reparametrization. So, but we can show that the Riemannian metric in X, in U, in theta, they all appear different. Okay, I'm gonna show the next slide. They appear different, they appear different. And in X and U, they are Hessian, but in theta, they're not Hessian, okay? So G can be expressed as a Hessian of a convex function in the X and U coordinates, but not in the theta. So theta turned out to be the bad coordinate now in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 the geometric property, right? So that creates a lot of you know, puzzle, okay? And, and there are interesting questions that the, these are the questions that people uh, sort of like, you know, hadn't really thought about even for a lot of information geometers. And these are the questions that we now start to think. And uh, it turns out that there are some uh, very deep uh, kind of a, a significance for these questions. And I have to go through everything and then get to the end, towards the end, if I have some time, I can talk a little bit about this because one of our recent papers is on explaining this phenomenon. And turns out this phenomenon is linked with a, with a very deep theory in geometry, like the so-called mirror symmetry and so forth. Okay, so, but I will leave this as an example for you. So the example is very straightforward. In theta, if you use theta, the, okay, I, I can show you this. Uh, uh, yeah, so if we write out, so if we write out the theta, so you have the Fisher metric is very simple, right? But if you write in terms of the this X coordinates, this is a, this is a Hessian of this one, but this is, looks, Kind of like this, it's kind of very complicated. You know, it's, it's another simple metric. But then if you use U, it becomes like this. It's also complicated, okay? This is a very simple kind of Riemannian metric, but then, but all these three Riemannian metric are related to each other by coordinate transformation because Riemannian metric is a tensor, right? So let me go back to talk about, if you have, say like, well, remember G is the outer product of the partial log P, right? The partial. So we let's see how these partials tra transform. Okay, the partial partial X. This partial partial because of the chain rule, they they would uh, uh, transform in this way with this Jacobian. This is the Jacobian. Jacobian is the matrix like this, you know, from X one one and then N one, you know, one N and so forth, right? So this is a matrix. So the partial of this transforms by uh, multiply pre multiply Jacobian. You know, that's how. So. Therefore, if you look at the G, the new G compared with the old G, it's just pre and post multiplied by Jacobian, right? By this thing. So you can really test out. So these three Gs are really related to each other by pre and post multiply the Jacobian that converts theta to X or uh, theta to U or X to U and so forth. Okay, so it's just a simple verification. Uh, by, by the way, I was uh, teaching a uh, information geometry class this semester. So I had a lot of experience of having students verify that. And once they verify that, they, they start to see, you know, what, what we are talking about and why, why parameterization is important and how do we, how do we transform uh, uh, the, the metric tensor when we do the parameterization, re But anyway, so this is the first thing I want to raise it uh, as a very elementary kind of you know, features of uh, you know, for this normal distribution, but then uh, the explanation of that has to come very, very late. Still at the moment, we are not fully understanding this phenomenon. But this phenomenon, it turns out to be a very important phenomenon. Okay, so let me now go to uh, the second part of this, this the, the duality. So informing geometry is, uh, is full of duality. It's about duality in the statistical inference, duality of the statistical inference, okay? So let us start with the, a familiar KL divergence. The KL divergence. Uh, so you have this P log P over Q, you know. Oops, sorry, this is, it's a surrogate to distance. 
it's sort of the distance, right? Because it, it, uh, it's, it, it's non-negative, but then it violates the symmetry axiom and triangle inequality, okay? But uh, it's known uh, that, well, you actually can derive it in a very straightforward. If you just plug in this thing, you have three distributions, P, Q, and R, they satisfy this identity. So this is the identity. So P to Q, Q to R, P to R, okay? You have this identity. This is just a, just plug in and just you find this identity. Now, under certain circumstance, right, the right-hand side will be zero. And I'm going to explain the circumstance, okay? So under some situation, the right-hand side will be zero. If that's the case, then we have this so-called triangle relation, the triangle relation. P to Q, Q to R is P to R, okay? So it's these things act as if it's the distance squared. And this is like the Pythagorean law, okay? So because of that, in, in fact, we can even derive a more general quadrilateral relationship. Okay, we can, we, can, we, can, we can derive a more general quadrilateral relationship. If we had four distributions, if we have these, 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 if a P, Q, R, S, we can write down this thing, okay, which is like more general than this. And when two of these, when any two of these become the same, it becomes the, the, the Pythagorean. The three points. So we have a four point relationship here. Okay. So, but on the right hand side, still you have this kind of quantity. So, we are going to look at the conditions when this, con when this quantity will become zero. And that would lead us to some, you know, either to this triangle inequality or the quadrilateral uh, uh, the relation. Okay. So, so, let's look at this. To explain the conditions, we need to explain this, um, the notions of uh, so called the E and M geodesic. Okay. Uh, these are the words uh, because we still didn't talk about what geodesic is. We the E and M E stands for exponential, M stands for mixture. So for the moment, uh, these are just the two names. So let's see what is M geodesic. Well, M geodesic essentially it's a it's a it's a parametrized family of density functions that's connected in this way. So so in other words, P Q. See, you give me P Q density function. If I form this family of density functions, this family is parameterized by t. t is uh, any like real number, or maybe we can take it between zero and one, you know? Okay, so, so in this way, this is, a, this is a family of distributions, a family of densities, right? Starting from q and then ending with p when t takes zero to one. Okay, so this is your parametric family. Now, this family is defined as M geodesic, just take that away. So it's just a mixture family, okay? Very straightforward. It's a mixture family, but this mixture, this mixture parameter is a one parameter mixture family, okay? So that's it. What is the E geodesic? It's also a mixture family, but the mixing in the log of the density function, okay? So, so, the log of this is a mixture, okay? Of course, in this case, you, you have uh, the normalization you know, factor, the normalization function here. The normalization function itself, we need to satisfy some, some conditions. And it turns out that the derivative of a normalization a function is the KL divergence uh, at the two ends, okay? But this one parameter family is the E geodesic, okay? So we have these two basically families. Mixture. This is mixing in ordinary density. This is mixing in the log of density. Okay, so e, uh, M and E and M. Now, this E and M mi mi mixing family. So this is M. No, so they actually uh, are related to the to the general kind of a M like general kind of N parameter mixture family, the more general mixture. Okay, so let's here we need to use the notion, we need to introduce the notion of so-called M flatness. M flatness is the space where basically the collection of any two points, then their, their linear mixture is also in that, in that space. So M flat space, so M flat space has a property that if you have any two densities in that space, then their, their M geodesic is also in that space. So that's, that kind of space is called M flat. So now you here you have a, a family, the family of density functions, which can be multi, you know, multi-dimensional, so to speak, right? Multi-dimensional mixing, okay? And then uh, this is called M flat, M flatness. So in general, well, you can anticipate that this kind of a 
So even given the piece of ice as being the fixed, fixed reference uh, densities, then I have this eta i. Etas can be any positive number, non-negative number, you know, uh, and then but less than one, the sum to one, that would be a, a mixture family, right? The mixture family that we know about. Okay, so this mixture family is necessary so for the M flat, because why? Because we can, for any two P and Q, we have this, their mixing coefficients. We construct this mixing coefficients of this, which is also in this, in this, uh, in this, in this space, right? Because we can have this. So, so this is a straightforward. Same thing we can do with the E. E is basically, we first define what is an E flat space. E flat space is linear, mi uh, the mixing in the log space, in the log density space. And then we define the exponential family it to be like this, okay, of this form. So, and we know that any e exponential family is E flat, okay? So we can show that. So with this two, then we can uh, explain the condition when the right-hand side would vanish. So the condition for the right hand side to vanish, right? We want we want to see when would this thing vanish. Well, uh, I, I have some other uh, intermediate steps that which I which I skipped. But eventually, what it come down to is that you can after some derived you know, some steps, what you find is that you have these things, and then uh, the, the, these are like the velocity vectors for for the two curves, and then this is the Riemannian. Uh, metric, the fisher rod metric, which is this, this is fisher rod metric here. So essentially the condition for this thing vanish is that this Q point, Q is the density, Q, P to Q is connected by the M geodesic and the S to Q is connected by the, by the E geodesic, okay? And so one, two, and this, these two directions are orthogonal. Uh, orthogonal, okay, so there are the three. So I, it's better to explain by this picture, okay? So uh, so this is a picture of the so-called, because the, the, the so-called E connection. So the condition of that is that this uh, they are orthogonal. So the, the E geodesic and M geodesic, they are orthogonal, okay? So say if we start with a point S, a density function on the, on the outside, and you know, we look at all the M flat, we have an M flat space, these are the other densities, which I you know, as I said, is M flat. Any two of these uh, can be connected. Uh, if you have uh, M GDC connecting that, that's entirely within this space. So now we can look at the projections of this density to this, to this M flat space defined by the shortest, say, KL divergence, okay? In fact, we can construct KL balls to grow out from the center and gradually, and then to see you know, the shortest, you know, radius that will touch it, okay? So, so, so uh, it can touch, you know, well, if, if you grow, the, you know, you can just have, basically I, from here, I can draw these E geodesics. I can draw these E geodesics and they'll intersect with this space at many, many points. And one of them is the minimum. One of them is the minimum point. The, so the minimum points is you're, when you're minimizing this uh, KL divergence when, the first element is being varied and second one is being fixed, okay? So that's called the E projection. E projection is when you are fixing the second one and then project to the, find the one that minimize the KL with respect to the first one, okay? So that's the, when you find the minimizer, the minimizer is called the E projection onto this space. And because of the Pythagorean theorem, because this, in this space, they are all M geodesic. E geodesic and M geodesic, when they are orthogonal, then, then you have this holds and this becomes the minimum projection. So this is a generalization of the minimum norm uh, projection in Euclidean space, except that now I have to separate out the E uh, geodesic versus M geodesic. In Euclidean space, E and M are just the same. You have one notion of geodesic, but in, the, in this, uh, uh, for you using the KL divergence because of this non-symmetry, uh, the, uh, the so you have to you know, separate out. There are two versions of this projections, either either M or E. Okay, so the same story holds because of the, the, this duality thing. Is just the, you know you have you can flip the, the other side. And the same story would also hold. So now if we look at the M geodesic, if you look at the M geodesic projecting to the E 
a flat space, you get the same kind of a conclusion you get, you can find a unique. So it's, it's a very do. Now, so in general, so this, yeah, this is a picture of saying that the E projection, okay? So the E geodesic project in the M flat space, M geodesic is the M geodesic project to the E flat space. So that's the, that's the general. So, and okay, so this is also say showing that in general, from any starting, from any point, you can have a lot of geodesic coming out. So connecting two points, P and S, you can have E geodesic connecting, which is the, which is this uh, blue curve. You can also have M geodesic connecting the points, which is the red point, okay? So in connecting the two points, right? Because it depends on what do you mean by, by uh, you know, how you mix them. You know, you, this is you mixing them by just the linear mixture. This is mixing them by the, the log of this, okay? So we have a, a different notions of mixtures. And uh, yeah, so this is about, okay, so I, I have to watch out for my time. So, so the, the KL ball, if you look at the KL ball, KL ball is that if you fix, say, starting from Q and you look at all the P's whose KL divergence is less than equal to C, so that's a KL ball, right? You have the E ball and have the M ball, and then these E ball and M ball, you can, so you have the E geodesic going out, connecting Q to the E ball, and then they will, uh, the minimum, you know, the radius, you can get one and you can deal it. So, so in, in all of this, you have the duality and you have to be very careful in dealing with this. Now, what I want to just very quickly kind of keep you in your, uh, in your understanding is that in the E projection, in the E projection, what the meaning of this is that the K is the minimum divergence or maximum entropy inference, okay? Whereas the M projection is the maximum likelihood projection. Okay, so this is, you can just check out by yourself. You can check out by yourself. You can check out, you can check out by yourself. Okay, so uh, they, so we recently actually make use of this and link that to the, some methods for divergence triangle. So uh, uh, in, in a machine learning algorithms, so I don't have time to go into that, but, but let me just quickly talk about uh, how this links with the maximum entropy inference. Okay, maximum entropy inference. So in maximum entropy inference, we want to maximize the S, the entropy, and subject to the constraint. So these are the constraint F sub i is unknown, P is this. And uh, so we introduced the Lagrange multiplier, Lagrange multiplier, and uh, we solve this modified unconstrained optimization problem, okay? And after we do uh, perform the calculus of variation, we, fit, we uh, fix the, the, the uh, this, uh, applying normalization con uh, constraint and the moment constraint, we 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 uh, can fix this lambda and uh, the uh, x, right? These parameters, and then turns out that we obtain an exponential family as our solution, an exponential family as our solution. Okay, and the second derivative of this function of this function is just actually the variance. The, this is the variance covariance matrix of the exponential family. So. What the maximum entropy inference method tells you is that immediately this kind of, there is a Legend no, duality between the X parameterization and the U parameterization. And uh, the X and U, they are two, there are two parameterizations linked with, uh, through this Legend transform, okay? So the, so the log generating function, the phi, and the, the dual is the entropy function, is the entropy function, okay? So the so you have this Legend duality between the uh, phi and the phi star, okay? So this is the, uh, the special part of the exponential model, exponential model. And this is the correspond to uh, the Riemannian metric, or the, the, the fish information has a very simple form, namely the fish information is simply the second derivative, the second order derivative of this function, okay? So that's the, uh, later on, you know this is the so-called the uh, uh, the uh, the fish uh, no, the Hessian metric the Hessian metric. Okay, so uh, well, I should also mention in passing that actually for for the mixture family, just like the exponential family, mixture family are also very nice. We have this mixture family, right? We have this parameterized by this eta and eta sum to one, and then you have this uh, uh, kind of you re so let, let's look at these independent parameters from eta one to eta n and uh, the entropy function for the mixing for the mixture family if you perform the, its calculation the first derivative second derivative the second derivative again 
it is the Fisher uh, information. So the, if you use the entropy function of a mixture family, calculate the second derivative is a Fisher information. And the reason is that if you actually do the calculation, you'll find out the second term vanishes. So this is exactly the Fisher information. So you see when you entropy function case of calculate the first derivative, it looks like this. Second derivative, well, you just you know, calculate the second derivative, but this part becomes zero because of the fact you have a mixture family. So the second derivative with respect to the parameterization is zero. So you only have the first term. The first term is the Fisher, is the uh, Fisher information, okay? So now for the, for the exponential family and mixture family, they are very nice because the KL divergence for two members of the exponential family, they just become the Bregman divergence. They become the Bregman divergence, okay? The Bregman divergence is defined this way, right? We're all familiar with the Bregman divergence. But if we use the exponential family, the two members of exponential family indexed by eta and eta star, this K KL divergence, sorry, this is equal to the Bregman divergence using this, oh, wait, oh gee, this is a, sorry, this, this should be X, okay? X and X star, this X and X star. And for the mixture family, the same conclusion would hold for the mixture family, the KL divergence between the two members of mixture family is also the Bregman divergence, but now the parameter is the mixing parameter and the order is reversed. Important, the order is reversed. Okay, so you see that that's why you know, the exponential family, mixture family has a, uh, intrinsically they have, they, have, they have a lot of things in common. There are a lot of connections. So um, one wonders what sets them apart and is there a way to sort of like look them under the same lens? And this problem recently is, uh, is solved. We, uh, in collaboration with, uh, with Leonard Wong at the Toronto, we actually solved that problem about uh, building a bridge between the exponential family and the mixture family. And so this is something uh, uh, looks like I'm not going to have any time to do this. Uh, it's, it's already 43 minutes. So I haven't come down to geometry. I haven't come down to, uh, okay, okay, divergence function. So Caesar's F divergence is the most general. Uh, kind of a way of looking at the, its homo most general homogeneous divergence function between P and Q, between two density functions. And uh, so Amari's alpha divergence, it could be one of its uh, the, uh, no, uh, uh, one, one special case, uh, the alpha divergence uh, itself includes the Hellinger distance, the chi-square divergence, the KL divergence as special case, okay? So this is just, you have whole class of divergence functions alpha divergence, but then which is then a special fun, special uh, case of the Caesar's F divergence. So now the question is uh, how do we generally construct divergence function? What's the principle behind constructing divergence function? So this is the question that I have investigated many, many years ago. And uh, it was actually first from a paper by Zhu and Rao in 95. So they, what they look at is this is alpha divergence, Amaris alpha divergence. They cast this alpha divergence in this way. So Amari, see, Amari just put this one here, see, like one here, one. So they had cast this so-called extended. So they put this term here, but this term is integrates, see, if integrates to one and one and one, okay? So, but this move is a very significant because it allows you to look at this divergence function, the alpha divergence function as a difference between the arithmetic average and the geometric average of two, num two density functions or two numbers, okay? So actually this, because of the fundamental inequality between the arithmetic average and geometric average, we have this hold for all sample values of the Z. So this is a, you don't have to integrate. You don't have to have the integration. This holds the non-negativity stands for any positive values of the, because P, Z and Q, Z are positive values and they always hold. Okay, so this points to a link with the, actually uh, the uh, convex convex analysis. Okay, so uh, the, the, the same can be found with in in a KL divergence. A KL divergence basically is just uh, you can look at this when we extend it, we put this extended KL divergence, and it's essentially this inequality. The integral is really this inequality, which is a convex inequality, which is really so. Uh, okay, I have. Uh, so we, uh, it's okay. So we, we actually, I don't have time to actually go to a talk about convex analysis. If you know convex analysis, it turns out that the definition of the convexity allows you to construct a kind of divergence function. 
This is called the D-alpha divergence, and I studied in my paper. So this D-alpha divergence, this is a, for any strictly convex function f, you can construct this non-negative number and take into extreme you know, alpha go to plus minus one, that becomes this uh, extended uh, uh, KL divergence, you know? Okay, so this is, a, let me see. Uh, Okay, so this this is uh, the convex uh, duality for this uh, f function, which I have to skip. Yeah, yeah. So eventually, by by this line of arguments, we can construct a two-parameter family of the, this divergence function alpha beta, alpha beta, where alpha is this mixing from the but the beta is indexing the here. This is the the uh, th this is basically the weighted mean, the weighted mean of the p and q. Okay. So now the advantage of this alpha beta divergence is that number one. When alpha goes to some special value, say like as a, uh, alpha equal one, you can take the limit of this expression. It becomes this uh, Amaris alpha divergence. Okay, this Amaris alpha divergence. Now I use the beta to index it. When when this parameter go to minus one, it becomes Amaris alpha divergence again. When beta go to one, it becomes Amaris alpha divergence again. But when beta go to minus one, it becomes what is known as the so-called Jensen difference. So it, it's a different member, Jensen difference, okay? So the introducing of this, this two from the family of divergence allows us to separate two kinds of dualities in a divergence function and in the geometry to follow, okay? So one duality is that, you see, when the, for P and Q, if I switch the alpha to minus alpha value, I switch Q to P. Okay, so this is alpha is a reference duality. It allows me to switch the two. Okay, beta has the role of a so called representation duality. So beta allows you to switch from one minus beta two to the one plus. So, okay, so in the extreme case, this is to the p to the log of p. So if you ever are curious about the EM duality, the EM duality being the mixture in the ordinary density function, a mixture in the log density function, where does it come from? This is precisely the representation duality because it's controlled by this parameter, beta. Now, alpha and beta are different. So in forming geometry, there are two kinds of duality. One is a so-called reference duality, which has to do with how the two density functions, when you have reference of one and the other, Right, you have a simple switch, then you can recover that, you know. And the other is a representation duality where it switch between p and log p essentially. Okay, so so when p go to uh, one, okay, this is uh, basically this is the uh, p and the log p because p raised to the power of zero, you can it, by a limiting argument this is log p. Okay, this is like I I will show by uh, you you can take some limit. So now. Uh, yeah, this is a Jensen difference. This is Jensen difference. So let me see. I have a okay. It's already five five minutes past the my allotted time, but I have the third part, uh, which is the geometry, the geometry structure, statistical geometry. So uh, I would have to uh, maybe just uh, quickly explain to you what has happening here, and hopefully when this is recorded, you can go back and, and verify yourself each of the step. But I do this very quickly. Okay. So we, if we take the KL divergence, I can take the uh, you know, just take the, the first order derivative and I, because we can see that this actually is zero. So we can see the first order derivative partial x and partial you know, y and they are all zero. So this means mm -hmm. the KL divergence is smooth at its min minimum value, you know, x equal y, okay? So, so x equal y is its minimum and then it's the first derivative are all zero. So they are, it's smoothly so. Now, what's important to do is to, to investigate the second derivative. When you do the second derivative, now you take the mixed derivative of i and j, okay? X, i, and y, j, okay? And uh, sorry, I, I missed the negative sign here. There's a negative sign here, okay? After taking this and then put the negative sign, okay? Now you get this quantity, okay, this quantity, okay? Now this quantity itself is symmetric in x in i and j, okay? But this is not symmetric in i, j. Now remember KL is not symmetric in i, j, okay? So you need to really verify this. You need to verify that if I take x, i, y, j, and let x equal y, is the same if I take x, j, y, i, and let them equal, and this is precisely this quantity called the Fisher information. So the second derivative of this becomes the Fisher information, okay? So, uh, so yeah, look like I, I am running over 
grocery times. Pablo, what should I do? Well, sorry, I was going to suggest yep. um, this might be a good time to maybe stop for a quick uh, question session. And because we have an hour yes. um, of a break, maybe I mean, also... uh, precisely, I mean, the time allocated for the talk is one hour. So you, yes. if you want to wrap up um, in the next 10 minutes, that would be good. All right. Okay. So I'll wrap up in 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I will skip through some, some of the, like uh, the, uh, uh, the quantities about like, so eventually what you do is that you are able to actually uh, look at the second order quantity, right? Second order quantity is the, is the Riemannian metric. This is the fisher round metric. Now, once you get the Riemannian metric, you can, it's, you can calculate so-called geodesic, Riemannian geodesic. Riemannian geodesic is the shortest path that connects any two points, right? So uh, you can basically, you do a variational calculus, you have the G and you can do the variational calculus and that gives you the uh, geodesic equation, the performing order Lagrange, and then you can calculate the geodesic. Then you get the so-called uh, Lavisita connection. So the Lavisita connection is, uh, arises in the context of the Riemannian metric in the context of calculating the, the uh, Riemannian geodesic curve. You can get this Levis-Civita connection. That's how you get this. Now, once you, the Levis-Civita connection, at the moment, you just look at this as being a bunch of functions, a bunch of functions on the manifold, okay? And they, prescribe, they give rise to this Riemannian geodesic curve. And this equation, the second order ODE, tells you what is the, the differential equation that characterizes the shortest path on the manifold. Okay, so this the Riemannian manifold. So you can have this, this, uh, this uh, second order ODE that gives rise to this, uh, or the solution would, uh, would uh, give you the, this, uh, uh, okay, so I, here is the example, for instance, for normal distribution, you can actually calculate all these things. You can calculate all these quantities, and then you can write out the ODEs for the normal distribution, and you solve this, okay? You can solve ODEs, you know, this is just a bunch of solving ODEs, and that gives you the Riemannian uh, geodesic, the, part that connects the two points with shortest distance. Now, for the Riemannian geodesic, it has the following property, very interesting property, that if now you look at its tangent direction of this Riemannian geodesic, okay? And you look at these tangent vectors, the tangent directions of this curve, and these tangent direction are said to be parallel transported along the curve. They're said to be parallel transported along the curve. So, and this parallel transport is using this so-called Lavisita connection, okay? So, along with the Riemannian geodesic, you always have the Lavisita connection. The Lavisita connection is a derivative of the Riemannian metric, and they give you the notion of parallel transport, the notion of the parallel transport. So, so on the manifold, you have these things that happened, uh, that uh, these structures, which are prescribed independently. One is a metric, the other is a linear connection, and finally, there's volume and there are other things. They are all independent structures. What people didn't realize is that you can have, you can prescribe a Riemannian metric, but you can also prescribe other linear connections other than the Lavisivita connection. You can do other connections. And information geometry precisely gives you the opportunity to deal with other connections other than Lavisivita connection. And these other connections form a dual relationship. And how is that done? Well, it turns out we are using the third order quantities of the KL divergence. We use the third order quantity, we calculate this gamma and gamma star, and the average of this gamma and gamma star, what is, it turns out to be the Lavisivita connection. So, and this gamma and gamma star can have the interpretation of the so-called dual connection or conjugate connection with respect to this Riemannian metric. So that's where this duality comes from. So I don't have time to get into detail, but essentially the, this, this is the whole, this is the story. So the difference between this gamma gamma star is the amount of change of tensor, so-called the third order invariance. And it is known that on the manifold, this quantity is an invariant quantity on the manifold, okay? So, so yeah, from this, you can then construct the alpha connections, which is just a, a generalization of the E and M connections on the manifold, right? So uh, I guess, yeah, from this, I'm, I'm probably just going to skip through the, the uh, axiomatic uh, derivations for this uh, FN connection, what FN connection is and so forth. So uh, so eventually FN connections essentially would give you so-called a curve, which its tangent vectors are parallel transport of itself. So if you have a curve on the manifold, if you look at the tangent vector, if it's parallel, if you move it parallel to each, to itself along this uh, curve, that become, that is called the, that is called the auto parallel curve. 
It's auto parallel. And FN connection defines the meaning of the auto parallelism. So what is meant to be auto parallel curve? Okay. So and then the next uh, message uh, I really want to emphasize, and I'm going to stop, which is for any divergence function, for any divergence function, any divergence function, we can induce this kind of a geometric structure. So we can induce a second order Riemannian metric and a third order, which is a, a pair of conjugate connection. That's for any divergence function. It's very general, not only for fischer ra not only for F divergence, for any divergence, you can, you can, you, you can think about, okay? So for especially for the, if you use the pregnant divergence, the structure in, introduced or induced is the so-called Hessian geometry, is the Hessian geometry. So Hessian geometry is just basically a, a very, very special kind of a geometry. So I, uh, yeah, I really should uh, stop, otherwise Pablo, Pablo is going to get mad at me. So <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> so I was- No, on the contrary, on the contrary. Yeah, on the contrary. I'd like to understand all of this uh, with a lot more detail. Yeah, um, yeah, so I, I mean, it's I'm, just, I'm it's just this, that it's I'm, a I'm, lot. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching this, uh, I'm teaching information geometry class. So it turns out that I'm expanding so my lecture. You, more maybe, more, maybe, maybe I can suggest that. Maybe I can suggest that. But I just want to finally just say one, to, one final word, which is recently, yeah, recently we 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 are actually able to link this uh, geometry with the with the with the mirror symmetry with it with the statistical we call it statistical mirror symmetry. There are two ways of looking at this parametric model: the standard way and our new way, and then we can link that to so-called mirror geometry. So what we have right now is this is what I want to show you. So St the statistical you know, manifold, the, 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 the manifold property density function somehow is miraculously linked with some very interesting theories in string theory, which is uh, the mirror symmetry and so forth. So I, I, I cannot go into that for sure. So I thank you very much for your attention and uh, welcome uh, uh, comments and uh, looking for collaboration with all of you. So thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Yoon, uh, for your uh, tutorial on information <laughs> geometry. Certainly, it's a lot of topics and very difficult to cover in one session. So, yeah, I hope that uh, you know those who are interested in the subject and uh, following from your presentation, uh, you know, will be able to check uh, on some of the lectures that you have already uh, made available on your website. Yeah. Okay, do we have any comments or questions for Yoon? Actually, I wanted to maybe repeat one question that appeared in the chat, uh, unless somebody else wants yeah. to. Uh, yeah, so uh, this, this was actually a question when you presented the Gaussians and, and discussing why we wouldn't want to use Euclidean geometry. Yes. And um, so uh, you know, maybe one answer is that, so the Gaussians that are sharper uh, would be easier to tell apart based on samples, mm -hmm. but... Um, what would be kind of your perspective on, on this? So why would we want actually to say that these two Gaussians should be farther apart? Oh, oh these two Gaussians farther apart, that's very straightforward. This is like, so the, the, in statistics, if you look at that, this is really the difference between the, you know, the, 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 the difference in mean over the variance, you know, statistical, very simple statistical test, all the, t all the statistical test tells you, you know, that these two distributions are separate, so, right? So that's, a, so that one is, a, is, is you know, less puzzling. I think the more puzzling part for the Gaussian distribution, and I really want an understanding and still we don't have, and I really invite other people's comments is that we have this parametrization, which gives you the fish information very simple here, but you cannot write this fish information as the second derivative. You can't find any function whose second derivative give you this. On the other hand, if you look at the X, look, treat this as an exponential family. So this is when you treat this as a location scale family. We treat the location scale family, you don't get, it's, it's not a Hessian geometry. Now, when you get the, if you look at this as a exponential family now, but you use X and so forth, you can write this as a, as the Hessian geometry, the second derivative of this and so forth, but the coordinates are very ugly, you know, in, in terms of the G, you know, it's very ugly, very ugly like this. So right now, it turns out that, Mathematically speaking, the geometry of this and geometry of this is very interesting because it turns out this mirror symmetry, we link that to some very deep uh, theories in mathematics. So this is our recent paper with, uh, with Kang and Gabriel Kang, my postdoc, uh, and we, 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 we talk about so-called this Kähler mirror symmetry. And then we, we, it, the, the recent paper is an archive, uh, follow up on our statistical mirror symmetry paper. So we clearly mathematically is interesting, but then statistically, we know this parameterization is basically the moment parameterization, right? And th this is the due to that, you know, this is the entropy function. 
This is the, uh, the cumulant generating function. But why the G looks so ugly? <laughs> so, that's what the... Okay, yeah, that's indeed um, very puzzling. All right, so are there any final comments? We are a bit over time. Um, Final question well, for you. I was going to suggest if, I mean, because yeah. I, I would like to ask more questions, but we could probably continue in Gather Town. Okay. Sure, of course. Want, so that sure. like people so can leave here and then, yeah. uh, because yeah. we, we also have the final session today. I don't know if you sure. want to do the advertisement for that. Sure. So I will then go to Gather Town. Is that right? Is it right now, right? Gather Town is saying, yeah, yeah right now. Yeah, we can we can meet there and like continue to okay, so okay so okay stop or, <laughs> we're trying to wrap up your talk you yeah. and see if there is okay. any final question at this time so if there is not any final question at this time uh please help me thank you again for his talk uh, hey, thank you all right so thank you very much you yeah. so now we're going to have um a break um for one hour followed by a discussion session in Gather Town. Gather Town is always open, so everyone who is interested in following up the discussions uh, is welcome to do that in Gather Town. So, mm -hmm. Yoon, if you are available, uh, you know, a couple sure. of people evidently are very interested in, in continuing sure. the discussion with you, and so that would be, um, that would be sure. great. Sure, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, already I'll, mentioned, I'll go there. So, I'll, I'm going to just sounds, log on to the- Sounds good. Yeah. It's available, right? The Gather Town is still available yeah, right now. Okay, so I'm going to log account. into this. Yeah, yeah. so fine. Okay, yeah. sorry guys, and I took up a lot of your time. No, so. no worries. Thank you. you <laughs> thank you very much yeah, for having me. Yeah. yeah thank, okay, you, so, yeah. thank you, Rob. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Pablo. Yeah. Thank Guido. Yeah. You're, yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> as Paolo also mentioned.